Good evening. Thank you for joining Mark Heidebrecht in conversation with Carrie Claire. We're here to discuss Mark's book, In the Shade, published by Friesen Press as part of Hamilton Public Library's Earth Month Conversation. As we considered Earth Day this past weekend, I hope that we have given thought to the Earth that is local as well as global, how nature is in our backyard as well as in conservation areas, and how our relationship with the Earth can be immediate and personal. Mark's collection of essays document her time hiking the Bruce Trail, 885 kilometers and 53 hiking days over four years, and it develops into a contemplation of friendship, loss, and the value of forests. Mark and Carrie will talk for 45 minutes, followed by a question and answer period. On the right hand of your screen is a chat box. Please use this to submit your questions and comments to our speakers. We encourage you to find Mark and Carrie's publications at local independent bookstores like Epic Books at their Lock Street and Sherman Avenue locations, King West Books in Westdale, The City and the City on Ottawa Street, and all retailers that support books and literacy. I will take a moment to acknowledge that the City of Hamilton is situated upon the traditional territories of the Erie, Neutral, Huron-Wendat, Haudenosaunee, and Mississaugas. This land is covered by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, which was an agreement between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek to share and care for the resources around the Great Lakes. We further acknowledge that this land is covered by the Between the Lakes Purchase of 1792 between the Crown and the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Today, the City of Hamilton is home to many Indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we recognize that we must do more to learn about the rich history of this land so that we can better understand our roles as residents, neighbors, partners, and caretakers. Now let's meet our speakers. Mark Heidebrecht lives and writes in the Dundas Valley, steps away from the, Ni the Niagara Escarpment. She qualifies for half price train tickets, but prefers always to walk. Pre-retirement, she and a friend completed the Bruce Trail end to end. Post-retirement, she wrote In the Shade, Friendship, Loss, and the Bruce Trail a collection of personal essays rooted in that experience. During the pandemic, she's balanced early mornings at her desk with helping to care for her young grandchildren. The recent addition of a second dog guarantees that she's on trails in our community several times a day. Were she inclined to tattoos, her wrist would read, take me outside. <laughs> Carrie Claire is a National Magazine Award nominated writer, editor of the M Word, Conversations About Motherhood, and author of two novels, Mitzi Bites and Waiting for a Star to Fall. She teaches blogging at myblogschool.ca, is editor of the Canadian books website 49thshelf.com, and has been a blogger for 20 years, currently at picklemethis.com. Her next novel, Asking for a Friend, will be published in spring 2023. Thank you for joining us. I'll pass things over to Carrie now. Thank you, Nancy. I'm so excited to be here. Um, the only thing I love as much as reading is rereading. And so I read this book in the beginning of the pandemic. Seems like a very long time ago, even, um, and it was. Um, and, and to come back to it two years later has been a, a really wonderful opportunity. Um, I loved it even better this time now it's all full of marginalia and, and scrawlings and I, i'm so excited to talk to mark about it um mark you're going to begin by reading us part of your book and giving us a taste for in the shade okay thank you carrie i'm reading um a section from the final essay in the book which is entitled within and for those of you who are watching from the Hamilton area. It's it's a reference to being within the Niagara Escarpment, sort of having that wrapped around us and also within um, within the heart within the heart of friendship. So two withins. What exactly happened to me while putting one foot in front of the other, repeating that action a million times to reach Tobermory? What happened while Pam and I were forest bathing? The phrase evokes swimsuits, but is in fact a translation from the Japanese, Shinrin Yoku, which describes the profound effect that spending time in nature has on mood, energy, and well-being. 
My conclusion can be distilled to this trifecta, the air, the earth, and an ally. Forests have a canopy but no roof, making the sky the limit for copious amounts of clean air. Add to that the ingenious design of trees by which they not only provide us with oxygen, but also mop up our carbon dioxide, some of it, and for the time being. On the trail, we could taste the sweet, weightless air. It floated into my lungs and crossed borders, plumping up cells to sail their cargo of energy to the rest of my body. Oh, the O2. I appreciated and knew the airline's directive to don and activate my own emergency mask before assisting others. How many times had I tugged on a plastic cup and adjusted the elastic band in someone else's life? Now I reserved non-teaching days for hiking and B&Bs that offered shuttling, aligning myself with mystics and musicians for whom deep breaths and complete exhalations are mandatory. Our hiking boots landed on moss, water, stone, mud. Regardless of the surface, each step put pressure on a power button hidden beneath, prompting the earth to release energy from its ancient abundant store. Topographical endorphins. Could they have traveled not only through layers of clothing to locate and strengthen muscles, but also through layers of resistance to locate and strengthen my sense of self? I was becoming realistic, practical, down to earth because of the earth. Finally, an ally. It was not difficult for acquaintances or observant hikers we met on the trail to discover the similarities Pam and I shared. Sketch a Venn diagram and the mutual attributes would enlarge the overlapping circles until only slim crescents of divergence remained. But that divergence was formidable and impacted the way we walked on the earth before we walked together on the trail. Me, a hand wringer. Pam, she pulled up her socks. For 885 kilometers, we had front row seats in each other's lives, witnessing responses to events and circumstances as they unfolded, creatures of our respective habits, until we heard accounts of familiar dilemmas with more favorable outcomes. My long-standing pattern of hesitate, act, regret, ponder, repeat, was not working for me. Me and my socks were in a slump, which made me keen for alternatives. From Pam, I learned that multi-angled speculation is exhausting as well as unproductive, and that when nervous energy is properly channeled, both anxiety and overgrown shrubs get pruned back. Perhaps from watching me, Pam learned to linger, to value good enough as an option. I never asked. Thank you, Mark. That's You're beautiful. Welcome. Uh, and it just it made me think too about what a gift this book is um, for Pam's memory. I mean, to be remembered that way through through art, the way you've done is just an incredible gift. Um, you know, you write about all the reasons why uh, what you learned from her and um, quite clearly it, it is a very reciprocal arrangement. Um, can we start by talking about the title of your book, In the Shade? And I love the line you wrote, shade intrigues me in both its botanical and figurative forms. Mm. Uh, can you talk more about that? Well, I, I think I want to find a place that is contemplative, but not gloomy. And so shade to me has a bit of a sense that you're out of the heat, you're out of the passion, you're out of the strongest emotions, but only temporarily and only to sort of reflect, be refreshed, be a little bit cool in the shady part of the backyard. <laughs> um, and it's, it's maybe a, a time also of less activity, just a, a stepping back and resting. Um, and in the garden, it's a place where really interesting things grow. Um, I think we tend to 
to always be looking at what's shiny and bright. And the shade plants just have a, a deep color, a richness, a stability. Um, and I, I just like that idea of sitting sometimes in that figurative and literal sense. <laughs> and I guess the forest. Is a, is a shady mm. place. The forest is a very shady place. Um, yeah, and quite often a cool place. So when you're hiking on a hot day, the forest has that sort of coolness to it, which which can be very refreshing. Um, the forest where we live is also a very wet place because it's it's shaded and damp and muddy. And I've sort of got the the boots and the paw prints <laughs> on the front hall to to indicate that as well. Um, I want to talk more about the forest. Um, you, you write about how the escarpment has been sort of a, a perpetual part of your landscape mm. always. Um, how did your experiences hiking with Pam um, change? Because, yeah, it was always there for you. What shifted mm. when you began your journey with Pam? Well, I think what happened was, um, and maybe others who live along the Bruce Trail, which which starts in the Niagara area and goes all the way up to Tobermory. I was very familiar with the sections right in Hamilton area, the Dundas Valley, water down Burlington, Ancaster. I had done a little more hiking in, in Niagara area, um, but finding out the parts of it that I had never hiked before was quite interesting in terms of even the Hamilton ones. And I would encourage people listening who who are in the Hamilton area. I had never really done the rugged city part of the trail. And so the trail goes up and down various mountain access routes. Um, so if, if you live here and you think, oh, let's go for a nice forest walk, you can take the Bruce Trail in the Dundas Valley or Burlington Water Down, Niagara. But if you want to see what it does up and down um, the escarpment in the city. That's an amazing walk that goes through all the stairs. I, I think we also had longer days. Um, and so just that rhythm of walking, I had some sections that I felt there was, I liked the cushioning. There was sort of a combination of softer soil and then maybe another layer of pine needles or um, last, the previous season's leaves. And it was just a very, cushioned walk. Um, not all surfaces were like that. <laughs> some some were pretty challenging, but she and I had different things that frightened us. So she would be brave when I was nervous and I, I would be brave when she was nervous. But it was That's longer, perfect. longer chunks of time um, just in that in that space where we breathed that air. A lot of talking. It wasn't the stillness of the forest that some people might want. Um, and the other thing we didn't do, and and sometimes I hear people now talk about forest bathing, and they want to make it so intentional that you sort of have to pause at each leaf, and you have to. We didn't. We didn't do that. We didn't. We didn't make it. We didn't make it into something contrived the way we sometimes do. We take simple, beautiful things in the 21st century, and we just add layers that that seemed contrived to me. We didn't do that with the forest. We just, we plowed ahead. We just kept <laughs> going. We kept going. And the shape of your journey, you, you write about it being like a jigsaw mm -hmm. um, for lots of different reasons. I found that really interesting. Can you talk more about that? Yes. Well, there are a lot of ways to do it. Some people start in Queenston and they go all the way through. In fact, I must give a shout out to Karen Holland, who last September started in Queenston and eight days and 22 hours later arrived in Tobermory. No. And she's, she's set the record now for the fastest completion of the trail. So that's one way to do it. Pam and I didn't do it that <laughs> way, obviously. Other people do it in camping trips that take about 30 days, the same route. Other people do it in chunks the way we did, but they start in Niagara and the Niagara area and they'll do the first section and then the next time they go back, they'll do the next. We didn't do it that way, partly just the logistics. We just wanted to figure out what we had to take, what we wanted to wear, how much food we needed. So we sort of experimented with length of days in our own area until we came 
to a conclusion that we were pretty comfortable with sort of anywhere between 16 and 22 kilometers a day, depending on the terrain. Um, and then we just started going, uh, experimenting a little bit further toward Niagara, a little bit further north. And we wanted to see how compatible we were with the long days, whether the, our work life schedule fit to do it, you know, a day at a time, a couple chunks at a time. And then we wanted to try the Bruce Peninsula because that involved um, a little bit more challenge. Some of the terrain is a little bit more challenging and the trail is not as close to access um, for parking and for cars. So you have to think that through. So we jumped ahead the first summer and we spent three days hiking there and we could figure out, okay, we, you know, we would share um, a B and B room, but not a bed. We would, you know, it took us 20 minutes to get to breakfast. <laughs> Neither of us, um, took very long to get ready in the morning. It seems like a funny thing to consider as compatibility. Um, we didn't want to shop. We didn't want to put on makeup. We didn't want to, there's a whole bunch of things that we just didn't want to do. And we agreed on those. So <laughs> after we had our first three day chunk, uh, we thought, okay, we, we know how to do this. We're just going to commit to doing it end to end. And then we started piecing it together. We did finish in Tobermory. Um, but the three days we spent there, we actually arrived in Tobermory on our first day and then we backtracked and did the other pieces. So yeah, it was a bit of a jigsaw puzzle. <clears throat> and and the, the guidebook gives you the description of the trail going from south to north. So if you go from north to south, you have to just be creative <laughs> with understanding. So if it was a steep ascent, going south to north, then you're going the other way, then it's a steep descent. So we just had to do that. But that was fine. That was it just made it um it just made it ours. Like we, we yeah. did it the way nobody we wanted, else has had that journey, I don't right? Think so I don't think so. <laughs> no, that's really remarkable. Um I loved the the thing that I took from this book that was of most practical value is that if you're hiking with somebody else, you put your water bottle in <laughs> their backpack and vice versa. Um, so yes, if you haven't read In the Shade yet, um, it's it's a beautiful book with so much spirit, but it also has many, many practical um, pieces of advice for hiking. Um, mm -hmm. What What is something else that, that you would want to impart to someone else who wants to take a similar journey? Well, this would be what we would call the um, Marg and Pam recommendation for anybody else who wanted to do it, who wanted to do it independently and not join one of the many um, groups organized by the Bruce Trail to sort of to map it out as part of a bigger organization. If if anybody's interested in doing it, we would suggest and we talked about this on the trail to have four people. One car. Two sets of keys. Oh. Yes, because we we had to rely on other people to shuttle us and that we, we made a way of we found a way to make that work. But if four people want to do it, I, I don't know if I can explain this without drawing it on a piece of paper, but <laughs> let, let's suppose let's just take two points. So suppose we're going to have a very long hiking day and start in um, in Hamilton and hike to Toronto. So um, the Bruce Trail doesn't do that, but let's suppose. So you get four people into a car. They would drive to Hamilton, drop off two people. The other two people would go to Toronto, park the car. The two in Toronto would start walking toward Hamilton. The two in Hamilton would start walking to Toronto. And then the Toronto people have their set of keys. They get the car. They go back to pick up the Hamilton people. Does that make sense? It is. Although I okay. bet that would be tricky to have people with the same ideas about makeup and getting ready in the morning. That's right. That you'd have to, you'd have to a agree. lot to coordinate. So there are, um, I've, I've I talked love... with a lot of women who have done yes. this in groups, larger groups, 10, 15, okay. 20. And um, yeah, there are lots of ways to do it. Do you think women do it differently than men? Um, I don't know. We, we, we hiked one day with our husbands, but we, we, uh, we just, wanted it to be our thing. I, I don't know how I don't know how men have hiked it, though. The record for the fastest time is held by a woman, so she 
she nailed it. I love that. You write in in the introduction, our mothers never ventured off like mm. this in their late 50s. Um, not if there were crustless sandwiches to make or shut-ins to visit. Pam and I had been raised in that world, but we attempted to model an alternative for our daughters to balance work and home, self and others, and to lift our noses from the grindstone just a little. Can you talk about that? Mm. Well, Pam and I were both born in the 50s. Um, both of our mothers were gracious, kind women, but I don't think that friends and leisure activities were something that were very high on their list of what would be included in a good week. Um, I think Pam and I carried on and ca I tried to carry on that sense of community and service and compassion that my mother showed me. But I feel I, I do it with um, a, a different spirit if I'm also doing things that feed me. And I don't know if the generation of women that my mother and Pam's mother were part of, um, I think they often came pretty far down the list on in terms of who needs something. And, <laughs> And and we just said, you know, this is what we need. And in the big picture, it makes us um, stronger, um, more able to contribute in other areas. But but we're going to make this a priority too. And how were your children inspired by that journey? Oh well, um, for one of the weekends. Um, my daughter and one of Pam's daughters actually joined us. Um, I, I think I think our kids have been proud of us. Um, all of all of our family, um, they're all people who want to be outside. My grandchildren want to be outside. Uh, we dress for whatever weather and out we go. So I, they may have resisted. There's a bit of a window in early adolescence when doing things with your parents is not too cool. So there was a bit of that. I always had um, great snacks in my pocket that I, <laughs> I tried to, to pull out. Um, you almost need them more when they're like 10 and 12 than you do when they're two and three. Uh, but we're, we're all just, when we get together as a family now, it's it's weather permitting a hike and then back here for food. We're just, yeah. out, people want to be outside. Yeah. Yeah. I find with my own children having like a bakery or an ice cream cone at the end yes. of a long walking journey is everyone's yes. happy. Yes. <laughs> We've done that. Um, one of my favorite parts of I, I loved the whole book, um, but uh, you talk about the conversation that you were able mm. to have. Um, and, and you even mm. write about how you'd run into each other at the grocery store yeah. and you'd be like, I'm not going to talk. I'm saving, saving these stories mm -hmm. for, for mm -hmm. our walk. Um, and, and you almost like um, you do like a kind of a topographical um, itemization of, of what your conversation was like. I think I think the way mm. that women talk to each other is fascinating. And I think you do, too, if if I'm reading this right. Um, talk about what those conversations were like. Mm. Well, first of all, um, we're lucky if we have somebody that if we need to say, I need this not to go any further, that you can say that too. And I'm I'm lucky enough to have a few people like that in my life, and including Pam. So there were times when it was a lot of venting, um, but I knew it would stay with her um, and she with me. But we did have we talked about a lot of things. We we have walked had walked together for decades anyway, um, and then we started the Bruce Trail. So. We knew a lot about each other's families, kids, what they were doing. We talked about work. Um, so we, there were a lot of updates, but I think what changed when we had all that time, we would start with all of that. And we would know, like we would know to say, well, you know, what happened to that premature nephew? Or like there, there were details about not just sort of how the extended family, but we knew the things that were happening. Um, but then we started talking about other things. We talked about um, the career. She was a teacher. I was a teacher. What what we, would you have been if you hadn't become a teacher? Or what would you have been if if you could have 
studied anywhere else and cost had been not an issue. You know, we, we just sort of out of the box things. And I, I don't know that that ever would have happened if we had just had our weekly walks that were an hour or two. Um, what was about it the, about the walks that that made it the hiking that made it different? Well, this is a funny thing, but sometimes when you're walking, you're not sitting eyeball to eyeball. You you're just sort of going the same direction, and it feels um, the space just feels a little bit more open. I think <laughs> you're either walking side by side. Most of the time, she was in front of me because the. It parts the trail is quite narrow, so she was in front. She was taller, walked a little faster. Um, so I was usually behind, but there's sometimes you can talk about things when you're not eyeball to eyeball with someone. I don't know. You're it sometimes happens in a car. I don't know how you feel about conversations in cars, but when we used to go places <laughs> now, we we don't go anywhere. Um, there would be times when if I wanted to have a, a serious discussion with my spouse about something, we, we would talk about it in the car. You, you're, so, you're also sort of on the trail or in the car. You're there for a while, so nobody can get offended or be in a huff or just say, well, I'm just going to go and do this and we'll talk about it later. You're sort of in the same space. Um, but I think also the relationship, having known someone for that long, it just provides an atmosphere where where anything anything can be on the table. Yeah, yeah. I love the way you write about friendship. Um, mm. You write about the way that um, after Pam died, that there there wasn't literature on loss of a friend. But I think that there isn't enough literature about about friendship. Mm proper um mm. and and so i love that that you're filling that space uh with this book um do do you, are you a collector of friends like is i i have a lot of wonderful friends yeah um and in some ways going back to there not being a lot of books about that i, I think we forget and those of us who have friends in our life um it's not the same as when a spouse or a partner or awful circumstances of losing a child, more familiar circumstances of losing a parent. It's almost as if we think we've got more, like a friend has died, but we've got more friends. Right. But my point is, but we don't have that friend. We yeah. don't have that friend anymore. And each friendship is unique. The history is different. What you have in common is different. And friends, we choose. And so we choose friends for a reason, I think. There's something that happens. Some people are acquaintances, colleagues, and it stays that way. And it's, it's quite an important part of life. But other people... There's something that we see in each other that we say we want to be in each other's lives in another way. And so when you have that with people and then they die, you no longer have that unique combination of interests, skills, history that came in only that friendship. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. And and you write it. So you uh, in the essay that is uh, among you write about mm. the, the bouquet. Now, first of all, I have to read you. I love your sentences. Uh, you, you're writing about um, the different people. And I guess we call it a network, but it's kind of a mm. sterile way to put it. But I love you said the neighbor who alters their route. So a morning walk can be shared. And the person who offers encouragement in a spin class are the beams and brackets that mm. scaffold our lives and prevent us from crashing to the ground. And there's a big heart in my margin beside that because I love that. Um, so, yeah, you did this really unique project that led to your book's cover. Yes. yes. Um, please talk about this project. OK, so I can't talk about the cover without talking with my good friend Tina Van Beveren who um, is a painter 
um, filled her the early part of her life with a lot of other activities and responsibilities. So she has sort of come to painting at a stage in which I came more fully into writing. So this idea of the collective noun, you know, a pride of lions, a school of fish. I thought, how do we talk about friends? And this was Pam died in March and this was the summer a few months later. And it, it hit me that we I wanted an image that valued the diversity in the group of friends I had, but also a sense that each one was different. And also because she had just died, a sense that when she wasn't in the bouquet, um, it, it th something had changed. So I went to our local Fortinos and I bought two big bouquets and I said to Tina, let's have this project. I will journal about the bouquet of flowers and you will photograph and paint the bouquet of flowers. And let's see what we learn about friendship and changes and um, she could explore it with painting and I could explore it in writing. And I just to preface that, that idea came from um, someone I met who was studying um, art at McMaster. And one of his final year projects was to partner with a student who was studying English literature. And the English lit person had to provide the artist with three pieces of writing and the artist would choose one of those to create an art piece. And the artist had to provide the English lit student with three pieces of art and they had to write about the art. So I thought if McMaster, which is my alma mater, can do that, I can do that. I'm not studying English literature, but I'm a writer. Tina's not studying art, but she's a painter. So we, in our own way, sort of had a summer project modeled on that. And that became the longest piece in the book and her painting became the cover of the book. How did the book begin for you? Well, it's interesting that you were just talking about that essay among because three years ago this month, I took that essay that I had written based on that project Tina and I did. And I met with uh, Kate Cayley, who was a writer in residence. I love her work. Hamilton Public Library. There's a shout out to the library yeah. again. And I took a copy of, she well, she took, maybe she said she could see about four pages. I, I forget what the piece was. Anyway, I sent her four pages. She met with me. Um, she was, so respectful and helpful and she gave me some very clear feedback some of which I use when I look at my own work today the one thing was she said you sure use a lot of italics <laughs> so <laughs> and she was right the other thing she said was does this move the piece forward and that is always the little question in the back of my mind when I'm writing and rewriting is this moving the piece forward and her point was if it's not moving the piece forward you probably have to cut it so she said to me um come back i can see you again in uh two months she said you can either take what i've given you as feedback and rework this or you can bring me something else so i thought well i'm not going to um squander this opportunity for this brilliant writer to give me more feedback on this piece. So I spent two months rewriting it and took it back to her. And uh, she read it and she said, what are you thinking about publishing? So it started in the library. So did you write the other pieces after that? Um, I think I'd been fiddling around with a number of them already. But this was the one that I knew would be the biggest and I, I probably needed some feedback on before I could finish it. Right. One of the pieces I wrote before I even had any idea that it would be a book, 
Um, but everything else was written after after Pam died. Did Pam have any inkling that this was going to turn into a piece of art? No, no. Um, she was always very encouraging. We exchanged cards and letters and um, she always she always said to me, you have such a way with words. Um, and the only piece of it she read was the one I wrote before she died. The, the February before she died in the March was the Winter Olympics. And I wrote a piece and changed it for the book, but it was called Despite. And it was about my sense of um, could I or could I not call myself an athlete? I love yeah, that. Yeah, that one. It, that, so one that one is very self-contained. Mm. Um, and it's it just it has such a tremendous shape. Um, yeah, I, I bet she loved it. She, she? she did love it. She did love it. Yeah, yeah. Um, for people who haven't read it yet, can you talk a little bit about um, about what that the piece context? is? About? Well, um, a neighbor of mine, a neighbor long ago, um, said to me in a public setting, have you always been an athlete? And like I looked around, I thought, oh, who is she talking <laughs> Who's she talking to? And and then I realized she was talking to me. Well, I sort of thought athlete meant you went to the Olympics and you know you made all the teams in high school and you've got you know a jacket that's got all sorts of sports badges. And um, but when she looked at me, she saw somebody who rode their bike to work, who hiked in the forest, um, who you know, got up early to go to the early bird swim at the swimming pool. So what she was seeing and, and who knows what word we use, but she saw me as a very active person, which I was and I still am. I think the athlete part um, to, to me had sort of connotations of um, very competent and very competitive and in all the athletic endeavors I undertake, I'm um, I'm persistent, but I'm, my <laughs> skills are very modest. I, I'm not fast. I'm not, you know. Um, but I did start thinking, what does it mean? And then it got me reflecting on, I need physical activity to just be fully alive. I need to move. I need to run. I need to jump. And it's not only for physical well-being, but that's how my brain works. Like my brain works when I'm I'm pedaling on a bicycle or when I'm walking at a fast pace. My brain works that way. So um, it, that that was the question that prompted that essay. And at the end, I, I I claim that that I am an athlete. That it matters to me to have a a strong physical presence on this planet. Um, in a, in a non in a non traditional way, and you you relate back to um, like you know high school gym, and I love this. Maybe mm. this gives me an advantage. If you never win and are indifferent to losing, all that's left is playing the game. I, yeah, I could relate to that. I never I never made the teams. I was always the manager. You know, like I, right. I just was never good enough. And my um, one of my criticisms of I have a lot of criticisms of education, but one of them in terms of high school when I was a student was that the kids who were good had chances to get better. And those of us who weren't already good, we, we stayed. We felt bad about not ourselves. Good. Yeah, just, yeah, yeah. Yeah. How did your experience hiking the Bruce Trail serve you? What knowledge um, from that served you in creating a book? Hmm. Hmm. I haven't thought of that. Um, I guess if anything, and I'll I'll sort of quote Anne Lamott here. Uh, we did the trail in chunks, and yeah. Anne Lamott talks about writing in chunks in her book Bird by Bird. She sort of says, "Don't worry about the whole thing. Just just write one piece." And I think we did the Bruce Trail that way. Like this. This is the chunk we're doing this week for three days, or this is, and we pieced it together. I think I did the essays in the same way. I wasn't, I, I knew I wanted to pull them together, um, 
but each essay stood on its own and I wrote it on its own and I didn't really think how it fit together with the others until I had um, about nine of them and then that's the point at which I was ready to start thinking about publishing it and at that point I got feedback that there were probably a couple gaps and then I wrote three more to make the 12. Okay. No, and it's interesting the, the shape of this book. Um, it it's it's not conventional. Um, hmm. You you have a lot of different pieces together, and it, it's a very unique um, form. I mean, look, friendship, loss, and the Bruce Trail. Hmm. You you've brought all these pieces together, um, and I, I love the way it's come together. Um, when it came time to think of the essays as a book um what was your like what was your response like did you submit it to traditional publishers um no i didn't um one of the reasons was i assumed that would take a long time and that it and <laughs> you're that it right would, and that it would be rejected and in terms of the timing even though the the hike was something pam and i had done together the loss was not just my loss. It, it was the loss of her other friends, her husband's loss, her children's loss, her grandchildren's loss. And I thought, if I'm going to do this book as a way of honoring her and reminiscing about our trip together, I think it needs, there's a bit of um, a timeline involved. I, I didn't think it made sense to spend five years on something and then bring it back to the other people who loved her who would have been finding their way through their loss of her and then all of a sudden okay here, here this is this is my my right. experience of my loss of her i i felt it just it needed to be done at a time that respected everybody's loss not That's just really mine. interesting. So this was a very personal project. It seems like you were mm -hmm. writing it for for yourself and the people who loved her. Um, is it is it interesting to you the way that it's resonated with people who didn't know and love your friend? It it is. I I um I'm surprised sometimes when I get feedback from people. There have been people who have lost adult children who have found me and said it has been so meaningful to them and in conversation what i'm hearing is um thank you for the opportunity to sit with grief and yeah. not be afraid of it and to give me another setting where i can find your words for grief that help me name my grief that's, you know, that's the loss section. Um, but at, at the other extreme, there's a man in our neighborhood. I dropped, um, I placed these in little libraries around Dundas. And one day this large tattooed man walked down the street and waved and he said, love the book. <laughs> <I thought. laughs> so we, we've since then struck up a converse, you know, conversations and, um, I don't know. I don't know what it was in it, but you think you know who will like it? I thought <laughs> sort of retired women hikers who had dogs. I don't know who I thought would like it. Um, and then some people. One woman said, "I don't hike. Uh, I haven't lost anybody. Um, I don't really like personal essays, but there was something about um, the connection that the connection between." Pam and me that she just she just enjoyed that reading about that so you you just don't know and that well, that's the risk when you you send something out into the world I mean I, I, at first I knew I wanted I wanted it for me I wanted a way to reminisce about that whole trip and experience there's nobody else I could reminisce with because I hiked with one person and she was gone so I could rethink all those things um uh now I forgot where I was heading with that. Where was I heading with that, Carrie? 
oh i know sending it out yeah, to the world. I, yeah so i knew i i wanted it for me and i wanted it for pence husband and her daughters and close friends my children um but then i thought maybe maybe it will be something that people beyond that circle would enjoy but then there's that risk i mean i i i feel i have revealed a fair bit about myself in that book um and so you're just putting it out there for anybody to read who might want to read it but it's 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 been great it's been great to well, see it's been who well finds received it. it was um mm -hmm. finalist for hamilton literary award it was um, I think that's really, really fantastic. Mm. And I know that you have had to do a lot of the championing of this book yourself, which is a huge labor, a labor of love, no doubt. But um, what has that been like? How have you been finding, I guess, little free libraries? Um, mm -hmm. What other ways have you been finding to connect with readers? Well, the timing um, when I published the book and it was launched in January 2020, I sort of said, I'm going to give myself a year to be very intentional about trying to find a place where this will fit in libraries, bookstores and readers. And then the pandemic hit. So that changed things quite a bit. Um, so I, I changed tack a little and um, I did. I did. I think because I felt I was. I don't know how I would feel if I'd published a novel or a book of poetry, to be honest, because I haven't done that. But I felt I was promoting um, friendship, Pam's legacy, the Bruce Trail, um, the value of being outside. I felt I was I could promote that. I could be <laughs> a little bit assertive slash pushy about that um, because that was sort of the focus. So I approached independent bookstores. Um, I approached um, our Dundas Museum, Royal Botanical Gardens. I just sort of knocked on doors with it and it was well received that way. Um, and then I, there have not been opportunities for live book events, but I did, um, I have done a couple of virtual things. A couple of book clubs have have bought copies so they could read it as as an entire book club. And then I've had great conversations with people when I've put it in little libraries. I kept yeah. a blog just for about a year because I wanted to do sort of updates there. Um, and and I sort of I gave it a very intentional um, focus with time and energy for yeah. for about a year. Yeah. That's the way to go rather than letting it sort of fall off. Um, so we do have a couple of questions and I just want to remind mm -hmm. anyone to um, to put questions in the Q&A and then uh, we can ask Marg. Um, the first is from Ellen who says, thank you for talking about friendship in this way. I had a friend die recently and it's nice to hear you talk about the mm -hmm. value of friendships. And yeah, as you write in the book, there there isn't enough about that, about friendship or loss and grief. Uh, and then Ellen asks, um, does the writing or the walking come first? Are they intertwined? And I guess you can you can interpret mm. that how you will. That's an interesting. OK, so I'm I'm wondering if she means the writing like the keyboard writing. Does, do you think that's what she means? Um, well, I'm thinking. Th does writing make inspire you? Mm. Okay, okay. Uh, or does walking inspire you to write? And, and do you, what's the connection? Oh, okay, so I, I guess I'll go back to um, what I was saying briefly about that piece about the athlete. I, I think when I walk and I think when I move. So I would say, today's an example. So I started the day with 90 minutes of writing. Um, and then the pieces that feel like they're left over and I'm mulling over, often get resolved when I'm walking and often get yeah. resolved when I'm walking in the forest. So um, there's a back and forth. The other thing that happens is I get ideas when I'm walking and then <laughs> I go back. Um, so there, there probably is a connection and I'm not sure in those situations if it's the forest or if it's the movement like the. Um, though I have 
I just thinking back on some of the things I've written in the last year, there's a piece that was really prompted in the forest um, with the sound of a bird call in the forest. And then that sort of made me go to the computer and then, yeah, so it, it's it's maybe mixed. I'll have to pay more attention, but it's it's probably mixed. Just being in the world is tremendously inspiring, isn't it? Like. Yeah, it can, when it's not overwhelming, it's inspiring, right? Yeah, well, and yeah. the forest gives you that space. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question is from Fred, who asked, do you have advice for someone who is starting out as a writer? Oh, yes, yes. Um, clear time, set a timer, turn off your phone, turn off the <laughs> internet, and just let it happen without criticizing, wondering, is it good enough? Is it not good enough? I, what has shifted for me, and it started when I decided to write this book, is I just became intentional slash disciplined about writing. I did not say I'll get up at four and I'll write till midnight. I said, I will get up, I will have breakfast, I will walk my dogs, I will turn on the computer for 90 minutes. Um, it's creativity is sometimes, and I know people much more famous than I have said this, it's sometimes a spark, but it's sometimes just a lot of sitting and writing and trying <laughs> and erasing and trying again and erasing. And I think there were times um, through this of the days that I was writing, I would say that maybe 15% of the time I just finished the day and I just said everything I wrote today was garbage. And then the next day I would go back and I'd say, yeah, but that, that <laughs> sentence isn't so bad. Yeah, so that's a triumph. Yeah, I, I think tr as best as you can, don't let the inner critic or the imposter syndrome or the um, sense that what could I possibly have to say? You have something to say. Everybody has something to say, and it's it's worth finding out how to express that on paper. Beautiful. Uh, the next question is: um, Is this your first book? Are you working on another? Mm, it is my first book. I'm working on a collection of essays. I realized that this is the format that I really like. Um, so I, my, my new discipline <laughs> that started last fall, I, I wanted to write a piece on retirement for an acquaintance who was retiring. And um, I said to her, I will get it to you by the end of October, which gave me a month to write it. Um, so I felt really good because I finished it in the month. And so I thought I'm going to keep doing that. I'm going to have an essay topic at the beginning of the month. And I'm going to say it's going to be done at the end of the month. It may not be perfect. It may not be flawless, but it's going to be done. So I've got a collection. Um, I will have um, my 70th birthday is coming up in two years. So my goal is to take these essays and do something with them, pull them together in some way. I, the, the way the shape isn't clear yet, but that's that's my goal. Can you talk a little bit more about the role that libraries have played? Um, you mentioned the the writer yes. residents. Um, yes. What else do you have to say about libraries? Well, I want to say three things. Libraries are special to me because of their abundance and their hospitality and their opportunities. So opportunity was the, the chance to access the writer in residence and the chance to have something like tonight. You know, the opportunity for somebody like me, who is a first time author, um, to to reach people who I may not otherwise reach. But just let me talk about the abundance and the hospitality. So uh, I took our children to the library all the time. I take my grandchildren to the library as is possible. And so I will quote um, a grandchild who was three at the time who waltz down the ramp to the children's section, twirled as only a <laughs> three-year-old can twirl on a ramp, and threw her arms in the air and looked around and she said, 
don't you just love libraries? <laughs> Millions of books and you can read as many as you want. So that sense of abundance that yeah. libraries provide us, that's how I feel about them. The second thing is hospitality. And um, I hope I don't get anyone in the Wharton Library in trouble, but a number of years ago, we were camping on the Bruce Peninsula, day hikes on the Bruce Trail with our kids, and the, t the weather was terrible, and we did our best to get out frequently, but there were a lot of times sitting inside the camper reading, and by the second or third day, we had read all the books we had taken with us. <gasps> I know, oh, no. Harry, this would, this would be awful for you. We had man. read the, the backup books. We had read each other's books. So we got into the car in this stormy <laughs> afternoon. We went to the Wharton Library and we went in and our plan was to each find a book, to curl up on a couch or a beanbag chair, whatever they had, and to read for the afternoon. So that's what we did. Then when we're getting ready to leave, I went to the desk and I said to the librarian, I said, oh, it's been a wonderful afternoon. We're, we're camping and we've read all our books and, you know, we're not going home till Saturday. And she said, well, do you want to take some with you? <gasps> and I said, <laughs> I said, we don't have library cards. She said, that's OK. So we loaded up on books. Now, I, to be honest, I'm sure she asked for some sort of ID. I don't know, maybe my <laughs> Hamilton library card, maybe my driver's license. I know she did not ask me to leave my firstborn child with her. I know that. <laughs> so we went back with piles of books, read them, and then on our way back to Hamilton, dropped the books off at the library on our way back. Oh, that is that, such a good story. Yeah, that is the hospitality of libraries and librarians. They, they want people to read their books. So. Yeah, that, that's how I feel. And and to add one more thing, we um, moved to this house 12 years ago. And, you know, re real estate agents say location, location, location. Now that my kids are grown, I'm not too concerned where the schools are, but where is the library? <laughs> so we are now yeah. a five minute walk from the library. It, it could have been a deal breaker if we had not <laughs> found a, a home this close to the public library. No, that's perfect. And and now your book is in the library. It's in the library. And I remember where I was when they called to say, we're going to put your book in the library. That was a fabulous moment. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, this book is such a gift to the world. It's a gift to your friend. Um, I think that you've just done the most wonderful job mm. um, Championing, it's such a I, it's it's such a wonderful project, and I'm so grateful that that you followed through because that takes a lot of courage to put yourself out there like mm. that. Thanks, um, Carrie. Thank you. No, it's it's wonderful. It it is a bouquet of a book for mm. sure. Um, what are you reading right now? Are you reading anything good or lately? Um, well. I've just, I, I'm in a, two book clubs and the one book club is an interesting concept that a neighbor of mine, um, I don't know if she came up with it, but she certainly coordinates it. It's called a pass along book club. So you, the, the person organizing it buys 12 hardcover books and 12 people divide the cost. So you pay one twelfth of the total and everybody gets one book in January and then there's a rota system so <gasps> I pass my book on and then somebody passes their book on to me so this week I'm passing on having just finished Miriam Taves uh fight night okay and yesterday um Joyce knocked at my door and left me a copy of Lyndon McIntyre's new book and I Fantastic. can't remember the title but this year we're also reading um, Cloud Cuckoo Land, Harlem Shuffle, um, I forget the others. And in the other book club I'm in, we just picked our books for next year. This month we're reading um, How to Pronounce Knife. In the summer so we're reading Jesse Wente's Unreconciled. Um, <laughs> the other titles escape me. Escape well, those me. all sound very good. Yeah, I think being a reader is a very important part of the writer's life. Very important. For sure. 
Well, thank you. So we've come to eight o'clock and I, I'm not sure if Nancy is going to reappear and conclude our event. I'm just um, going to say thank okay. you to uh, to Mark and Carrie for this amazing conversation, for including all of us in it. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us. If you joined us halfway through, um, this has been recorded and it will go onto our YouTube um, in the near future. And uh, I just like to wish everyone a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.